Hello everyone, and as always, welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today we are going to continue on with our basic tutorial for Paradox's Crusader Kings 3. This is episode number 8, and in this episode we are going to dive into the politics of our council which is right up here. Looks like a counselor's chair, I suppose. And you will see you have six counselors. Okay, well, what does a council do? Uh, it's kind of common sense, right? They help you rule your realm. And so the five counselors down here correspond to the five player skills, whether they be playable players or non-playable characters, those five skills are diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning, right? We've talked about those many times. Well, if you look over here, we have diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning. So they're a little different order, but you get the idea. It's the five player skills, okay? And these counselors that you're able to pick, you're able to replace them, you're able to you know, figure out how you want them on the council, they will be helping you rule your realm through their skills in each one of those different skills. But before we get into each one of those, let's talk about the wild card sixth counselor, and that will always be your primary spouse, okay? So our primary spouse is Petty Queen Gwugon, and if we look back here, she's our primary spouse. She's shown up here, okay? And then you see down here, secondary spouses. So, you know, none of these women would be our counselor. It's always going to be our primary spouse. So our primary spouse is right up here. She is treated differently than the other five counselors. And let's talk about how. Well, you have a decision to make. You can make your primary spouse either a general helper, let's put it that way, by picking assist ruler. And if you pick assist ruler, which is the general, and let's pick that really fast. If you pick that as what she's doing, when we roll over it, you'll see here, her support will give us plus one in diplomacy, plus two in Marshall, plus two in Stewardship, plus three in Intrigue, and plus one in Learning. Those skills are directly added to our own. You may have noticed that those numbers changed when we clicked on Assist Ruler, that changed. So just remember 6, 24, 12, 10, and 6, you know, or the basic idea of what these numbers are. That's when we picked assist ruler. So that is kind of the catch-all selection. You get a little bit of help everywhere, okay? And so, as I said, those numbers of hers, the better she is at these things, the more she will add to you. So if we click on her again, you see she's a 9, not bad, not terrible, 10 in Marshall, 13 in Stewardship, which is pretty good, but 16 in Intrigue, which is very good. Now, when you look back over here again, you see it kind of corresponds, right? Diplomacy plus one, Marshall plus two, Stewardship plus two, Intrigue though, she gets a plus three, and then Learning plus one, okay? So it, they are based on her skills, but you're divvying them up a lot because you're picking this general uh, assist ruler option. But let's say that you want something special, okay? And there's strategy that goes into this, right? Let's say that you're really bad at diplomacy and you want her to help you more with diplomacy. You can pick that. And if you pick that, she only helps you with diplomacy, but she gives you a plus four in that. Now you may remember with assist ruler, when we're parceling it out to all five, she only gives us a plus one. So, you know, if we want more diplomacy, we could pick that. If we want more um, martial skill, now they don't call them exactly the same, but you can see the icon here, right? And how do they derive these numbers? Well, it is exactly half of her skill rounded down. Okay, so 16 becomes 8. 8 becomes 
four. You know, 13 becomes six because you round down. So, you know, it would be either six or seven, you round down for managed domain. Okay, so let's look back at our character here. We're really bad at diplomacy and we're really bad at learning. Uh, we're very good at martial. So right now we've got a cis ruler on. She's giving us a few points in everything. Why don't we have her, hmm, interesting. Which one of these would be best? Well, unfortunately, her two worst skills are our two worst skills. Uh, so uh, we could do court intrigue. Yeah, let's just do that. And you'll see it dynamically updates your skill set based on what her skill set is. Now, you may remember when we were picking a wife, and let's do that again. Let's just go pick supposedly a secondary spouse. One of the search criteria here is sum of all skills. Well, it's those five skills. So the game adds those up and shows you who has the highest sums of skills. But let's say that you really want a wife that's going to help with your martial skill. You can then filter it for that. Uh, now, this wouldn't matter, right, because this is a secondary spouse. But I'm just showing you when you do search for your primary spouse, how those skills come into play and how you have to start thinking, oh, she could help me because, you know, she will be placed on the council and she will add her skills to mine and that's how the that's how the queen works she's kind of a wild card um i most often play with her kind of giving us a, a general bit to everything uh now he is very weak in learning and diplomacy so you may want to buff that and kind of forget about this or she is very good at stewardship and intrigue so you may want to bump that up you know you can bump his intrigue skill up quite a bit by giving her plus eight to him you know let's look at that court intrigue you know now he's a 15 right whereas when it's a cis ruler he's only a 10 and a 15 would be very important for him to try to do schemes on people or discover schemes being run against himself. Okay, um, she also does not have any of these special things that she can do. She doesn't have a task per se, and I don't mean this in any sort of sexist way. Her task is to be our wife, and so she's at she's a counselor to us at night. She's talking to us, you know. Evidently, she's talking to us about all five of these things and giving us some points through her wise, hopefully wise counsel, right? So then we have the other five counselors. And as I said, they correspond to the five different personal skills each character has. All right, well, our Bishop Constantin here, he is learning. We have appointed him to be the learning counselor, if you, if you want. Um, in this case, this bishop in our religion, the bishop is always the learning counselor, or it's knowledge. I should I should call it what they actually call it, you know, for shorthand. Uh, well, I guess it is learning. Learning, knowledge, okay, you get the idea. Uh, learning 25 is excellent. So let's click on Cossington, and you see here, indeed, his learning is 25. He has a base 8. He's chaste, so he gets a plus two. I guess he gets to read more since he's not interested in carnal pursuits. He's ambitious. He's a mastermind philosopher. Nice. So that's his education trait, which gives him a plus eight. It's fantastic. Um, he's also a scholar, so he got this lifestyle trait. He's picked this up along the way which is a plus five. So all in all, he is just a wonderful learning counselor. And that, the learning counselor, will always be your bishop. This helps you in a myriad of ways. So when you think about the counselor and your counselors down here, the game is constantly rolling dice. Um, you know, that's the best way to think of it. There are all these possible things that could happen. There are things that could be learned. People, you know, there's all sorts of random event. Oh, I say they're random, but there are events that could happen, such as you learn a new, the Irish culture learns something new through Cossington's study 
okay? Well, then the game will roll dice and see if that's true. Well, the higher his learning skill is over here, the more likely it is that that event is going to fire or you're going to get that bonus or you're going to get that advantage. So if, let's say, there's a, uh, you know, a dice roll for do you get uh, one of these things that are, remember down here in our culture, we're fascinated with something. Well, there are certain events in the game that can have you automatically learn one of these things for your culture. That most likely or possibly could be based on your bishop's learning skill. And it'll the game will roll the dice and say, sure enough, the culture learns this uh, or your uh, realm learns this, let's say, because Cossington's knowledge learning score, I'm sorry, was higher than what was needed, okay? And so that's kind of how that works. It works for all of them this way, but learning's kind of an easy one to think about because there will be certain events in the game that we can either learn or not learn. And Cossington's high learning skill will go into us potentially learning that. Now, that is not added to our score. It's not like the queen. The queen is added to us. Cossington is his own person. He's a counselor. And so this learning skill is individual to him, but it does help us rule our realm because he could learn certain things. We could pass certain tests. Certain things can happen because he is a good learner. Okay. Now here normally, and in some areas, you would be able to change <clears throat> your counselor. That's your learning counselor. But you see here, Insular Christianity does not have a revocable clerical appointment doctrine, meaning our cleric, our bishop, will always be in this spot. Okay? Without such a doctrine, there is always a court chaplain or a realm priest. And you cannot, um, Insular Christianity does not have the temporal, revocable, or temporal for life clerical appointment doctrines. Okay, so it's possible that we could get our faith there if we really wanted to um, as we build up uh, piety. This could be one of the things that we could change with our piety or uh, changing, you know, cer certain options to change our religion as we go through the game. But as of right now, you know, it tells you pretty simply there, we cannot change him. And quite frankly, why would we want to? You know, it could be that we want to change, get rid of him eventually because he doesn't like us and he's not sending us taxes and he's not sending us levies. But there's absolutely no reason to get rid of him for his knowledge skill, which is quite, quite good. Now, you'll see here the bishop then will be doing one of three tasks. So for each counselor, there are three tasks that that count, except for your primary spouse. But for the other five, there are three tasks that they could potentially be performing. And they will be performing those for you uh, essentially at all times, okay? So for the bishop up here, for the learning skill, um, religious relations, okay? We could pick this, and right now this is what we currently have picked. You see it lit up here. He will be assigned to religious relations. And what does that do? Well, it gives us uh, 125 a month in piety. Great. And if we look up here at piety and we see why we're getting 299 a month, you'll see 125 religious relations. That's what I one of the things I really love about this game and the tool tips in this game. You can go find out every single number why it exists and why it's adding or what it's adding to and how it's adding to it uh, so piety is 125 a month uh, that's from his learning skill um, insular theocratic ruler opinion goes up plus 12.5 uh, increases by such and such a month and his learning skill also adds to that okay uh, possible side effects because he's such so highly skilled at this is an increase in vassal opinion. That's possible side effect. So it may happen, it may not, based on a dice roll. So we could pick this, religious relations, and this really, you know, just step back for a minute and think about what these are. You know, he's trying to improve the religion's relations to the people 
to you, to everyone. Um, so this is just out him, him out improving relations between everyone and the church. Now the second one is convert faith in a county. Cossington cannot perform this because there are no valid targets. And why is that? Well, we haven't taken over any counties. And any of the counties we take over here, there's no one that's going to be there to convert. Now we do know if we look at our map, uh, hold on, if we look at our faith map, that if we were to take over this county, uh, Dublin, I assume that that becomes Dublin, uh, if we take over Dublin, then we may have to convert the people in this county to our religion. And if that's the case, then we could come over here, we could select this task, and we could send Cossington over here to start working on converting these Catholics to insular Christianity. Okay, so that's the second task, but that's not open to us right now because we haven't taken over any counties. The third one is fabricate claim on a county. Now, this is possibly the most powerful uh, task that any counselor has in the game. And what do I mean by that? Well, we've talked about how you have got to have a causus belli to declare war on another uh, realm. Okay, so if we wanted to declare war on Konacht, we would have to have a reason. So let's click on Konacht and let's go to Petty King Aid and let's right click on him and we'll see declare war. And it says use a causus belli to declare war on him. Okay, our claims. Uh, okay, here are our claims that we have against him. Objectives, the Earldom of Connacht. We have a claim on the Earldom of Connacht. And if we come over here and look at our claims, it's unpressed. And you may remember earlier in the tutorials, his minister had a slip of the tongue and said, hey, we have, you know, the petty king Murshad has a proper right to Connacht. And that's what gave us this claim. So we have a claim on Connacht. We could go up, we could declare war on him. You see here, it says it's lit up, it's declare war. We can do it if we want to. It would cost us 100 points of prestige. Um, and that's because we have a claim. But let's say if we don't have a claim. So let's go to Athlone here and we'll see Earl Conchabar. Uh, so he just controls the county of Athlone. Let's right click here and you'll see here, declare war and, it, and it's grayed out. And it says, use a causus belli to declare war. And it says, you do not have a causus belli on Earl Conchabar. Right. Well, what, what could we possibly do about that? Well, you could get someone in your court. You could lure them to your court that has a claim on Athlone somehow, and then you could use that claim to declare war. You know, that's kind of a round, you know, that's really a roundabout way of getting there. The easier way to do it is, is to have your religious man, Bishop Cossington, select fabricate claim on county, have him go to Athlone. And now see, this is lit up. It will tell you he's got 12 months left. He will be trying to fabricate a claim on Athlone. And when he does, or if he does, if he's not skilled enough, he maybe won't be able to do it. But if and when he does fabricate this claim, then you can declare war on Athlone, but you cannot do it before then. So this is very powerful, right? Because right now we've only got two claims. We've got one on Desmond because it's part of our uh, duchy. It's just not part of our realm yet. And we've got a claim on Connacht, but that was almost because of an, I say almost, it was because of an accident by that king's, that petty king's counselor who made a mistake. That also brings up something else about your council, which is your counselors are out there doing things. They can make mistakes. They can say things they're not supposed to say. They can make people mad. And that all kind of redounds on you, right? So if your steward here, Earl Ragnald, is out 
collecting taxes in a brutal way and it makes the people mad, they're not just mad at Earl Ragnold, they're mad at you. He's your counselor. It's no different than politics today. You know, if somebody in the government does something that, that's part of your party or, uh, you know, one of your cabinet members, let's say, that redounds on to you because they're acting at your behest. Um, and the same thing goes here. And so you will get events that pop up quite often, that, well, I say quite often, here and there, that'll say something like, you know, Earl Ragnold uh, has... Uh, has earned the enmity of his people for being too harsh and collecting taxes. And a big reason why that might be is he's not a very good steward. And that's what a lot of these skills go into. How good are you at doing your job? Uh, and he's not very good. He's a nine. And he might be someone that we're looking to replace. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So now We've got our bishop fabricating a claim. We've called the church in and said, hey, tell everybody that these people in Athlone are heathens. We need to declare war on them. And it's a very powerful tool, okay? Over here, you'll see your Rome priest does not endorse you because it's got this red down thumb. Uh, and again, that's bad because he's not sending us taxes or levies, but you can always see this right here. Um, and that's really your bishop card. And so the wife and the bishop, there's not a whole lot you can do about those two. But then the other four, we get down here, they are directly appointed by you. And you can pick anyone at your court or any of your vassals. And I'll just start with the vassals very quickly. Here are our two vassals, Earl Ragnall and Mayor Finsnecta. Okay, and then you see the fist here. That fist means that they are a powerful vassal. And you can read, the, this ruler is a powerful vassal who expects to remain on the council. And this can become a real problem because as you take over more counties or you have more counties in your realm, you will have more powerful vassals and maybe more than you can you can stuff onto your council here, okay? And some of them are going to be mad. If they are not on your council and they are a powerful vassal, it upsets them and it really hurts their opinion of you. And so you've got to balance, you know, like Earl of Ragnald has, is a terrible steward, but we've got him on the council right now because... If he's not on the council, he's not going to like us as much. It may be as much as a negative 20 or negative 25. So let's click on him and see what he actually is good at doing. And of course, it would be learning. And we can't put him up here in learning, right? Um, and so we've picked out the thing that's best. And again, you could leave him off the council probably not wise even though he's not good at this it is going to cause some bad events to fire when it comes to stewardship we may lose some taxes they may say he's not good at collecting them he may make people mad there's a lot of you know different things that can come up but a lot of it will be caused by his poor stewardship um, so we'll just go straight down while we're all already talking about earl ragnald we're going to keep him on the council for now Stewards, the best thing he's got. Now, what are his three tasks? He could collect taxes, which is what we have him doing. Um, and that ups the amount of taxes we collect, possible side effects, extra taxes. But you may get some county corruption. All right, because he's going to be out busy in the countryside, I assume, or his men are collecting the taxes. There might be more corruption back at home. So what's the second thing is increased development of a county. This is a very powerful one as well. As you can see, it increases development by one. Building construction time goes down by approximately 11%. Holding construction time, development growth, all of these things. And then it'll tell you possible side effects based on his counselor's skill, which is not great. So it's kind of 50-50 down there. A Efficient taxation, increased control, increased control, blah, blah, blah. Slow construction, loss of opinion, loss of control. So these are just telling you the side effects that can happen because he's bad at this. If we look up here, because Costanton is such a good learner, 
you know, possible side effects of his skill, uh, nothing, nothing bad, right? So they'll list the red ones in bad, and so it's kind of warning you of some of the bad things that can happen because he kind of stinks at his job. Now, which one do you go with here? Well, early in the game, you need money. You need to build up your money supply. Development is very important, and it's not something we've talked... Eh, I'm going to get out of this for a second and actually go to the county view. Now, here's the earldom of Thomond. You see development is six. Now, one map that we have not looked at a lot, if at all, is the development map. Okay? Um, the development map shows you the development in every county that's out there. And then while you're in this map mode, you can go over the tooltip here or the uh, the pop-up and it tells you development of 22 at Versailles. Wow, that's pretty good. What about people around us? Uh, over here, the city of Drakeed, which is here in Ireland, has a development of 10. Desmond has uh, nine. Ormond is a six, we're a six. So we're kind of a little underdeveloped. Uh, it, you know, a lot of Ireland is a six. Up here in Ulster is an eight. Uh, and as I said, Dublin is a 10. Uh, over here in England, we've got some 13s. We've got, what's the most developed? Let's look over, I guess London really. Barony of Gore. Uh, you know, it's a 13. As I said, you've got 22s. The lighter it gets, the more development. In Rome, it's a 30. And what does development do? Well, development is a measure of the local infrastructure and technological advancement of the county. Higher development increases levies, taxes, and supply limit. Okay, well that told us some interesting information, right? I generally like to have my steward building up development, and especially in my own home county. The reason being is, this is going to, it's more of a long-term play, right? You're gonna build up development, and over time, that is going to give you more taxes, it's gonna give you more levies, it's gonna give you better things, you'll be able to start building newer buildings, faster, etc. So. You know, it's going to take him six years to do that, right, with this task. But it's a longer term play. It's a longer term game, right? So that's probably a wise choice. Although if you really need money right away, of course, you know, have him start uh, collecting taxes as fast as he can. Um, his third choice is to promote our culture. Again, these ones that are blacked out now are generally when you're going to have your counselors working on another county that you've taken over. This is not going to be a big deal while we're here, right? Because this is pretty much all Irish culture. But let's say we skipped over here and started taking counties in Scotland, well, or England. That's not the Irish culture. And they are going to rebel. They're not going to give us as much in taxes. They're going to give us problems. We may need to have our steward go in there and have him start getting them to, to dig the Irish culture, right? Uh, sure, river dance, potatoes, all of those things that make Irish culture Irish culture. He would go in and start, it's almost like converting their religion, but you're converting their culture. Okay, um, and also if you want to choose anyone else, that's what this is up here. And you will bring up everyone at your court and all of your vassals. And I will just do as say as an aside here, that's why your court can actually be quite important. And we haven't talked a lot about our court. So let's go look at our court and see who is good at stewardship. Aha! It is Gwynlian Furchbladen. This just so happens, when we click on her, you'll see, happens to be Brian's wife. And is she ever a looker? Um, Brian's wife is very good at stewardship. And when she becomes his spouse someday, she's kind of terrible at every 
for the most part, she's all right at Marshall, but she's kind of terrible at everything else. This is the kind of uh, primary spouse that you would want to click on, you know, help with managing the domain because she's so much better at that than she is at everything else. Uh, Gwagon, meanwhile, has skills pretty good across everything. So you're like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is great. She's great at stewardship. I'm going to go replace Earl Ragnald with Brian's wife. That should really cause some talk around the court. So we look here, who, and this button right here, appoint a steward, we would fire the Earl, which is going to peeve him, right? And then we can sort for stewarding. And we look down here and you say, well, wait a minute, we're we're sorting, uh, ascending, and where is Brian's wife? Well, we cannot appoint her to our council. And why is that? It's because our religion is male dominated. And if you look down here a little ways, it says only men and vassals can be appointed chancellors, stewards, and marshals. Okay, let's kind of unpack that for a minute. So only men and vassals. So if we did have a female vassal, which is very possible, she could be appointed to the council. Okay. Otherwise, only men can be chancellor, stewards, and marshals. So chancellor, which is your diplomacy guy, steward, which is your stewardship guy, and marshal, which is your military guy. Okay. Only males can be in those uh, counselor positions. Now, a female can be a spy master. They can use their wily ways of the feminine to get people secrets, to kill someone, to help you imprison someone. They can do that, but they cannot be chancellors, marshals, or stewards. So just keep that in mind that sometimes if you can't do something and you say, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, it's oftentimes because of your faith or your culture does not allow uh, males or females to do something, okay? And so always go down here and look because these are real regulators on what you could do sometimes uh, when it comes to appointing people or having them do jobs. Well, be that as it may, we are not going to replace the Earl Ragnald. He is a powerful vassal. It's more important to keep him happy, even though he kind of stinks at this job. Again, but if you wanted to, you can sort and search, and that's all going to come from your court. And so we've got to start thinking about these people. You may have thought, well, these are just kind of throwaway people, but we can go down here. Um, oh, that's our daughter. How sweet. This is our queen, um, slain. She's our courtier. She does not have a spouse. We could go out and search for someone that's really good at Marshall. Well, that's us. Um, this is our half-brother in Marshall. But how about Thoreed? Thoreed is Anglo-Saxon. He's got a 13 Marshall skill. We may want Thoreed to come to our court to be a knight or to help us with wars. So let's see, he will accept. He's gonna come over here and marry our courtier. That's great. But um, she would go to his court, right? Because most things are all patrilineal. We would go down here and click matrilineal so that their children come to us. Um, and also they stay in our court, right? So we're trying to bring him. So we would send that proposal. He'll come marry one of our courtiers, become her spouse. They will be at our court, and now he will be at our court, and we can use him to become a knight. You have to start thinking about these things. Um, and that's why you would want more skilled people and how you get them to your court. You can either invite them to court if you see them somewhere in the game, or you can marry them to one of your uh, other uh, existing courtiers. Uh, same go so you're basically at the start of every game going to want to try to marry off everyone you can. But in the case of females like that, you want to do it multi, uh, multi 
now I can't say it, matrilineal, because you want the female to control the relationship, whether it be where they're located or what house their children will be part of or what court their children will be part of. Okay, uh, Chancellor, now this is our cousin, Chancellor and Knight. He is our diplomatic guy. Again, we could replace him. It's a lot easier to replace him because he is not a powerful vassal. He is just a relation of ours. Uh, but that would also hurt his opinion of us if we did do that. It's just not as big a deal if they're not a vassal. You'll see the green teardrop here. Maybe that's a green blood drop, meaning that he is our cousin and a member of our house. Okay. The diplomatic uh, or chancellor can do foreign affairs or domestic affairs. You have him focus on one or the other. I will let you read you know, what the effects of those are, but it's either foreign affairs that he's focusing on or domestic affairs. His third one is integrate a title. Again, we have not taken over any land. And so the blacked out ones are generally things that will come into play once we start taking over land. Now, if for some reason we take over land and can't get the title, or we get the title and other people claim it, we can have him start to integrate that into our line and make it really ours okay we may hold it but it, he'll, he will cement that let's put it that way our marshal is lorcan brian lorcan is our half brother uh, he's got a pretty good marshal skill here um, again we could replace him if we want he is of our line in our house but he's not a vassal we only have these two uh, he can focus on organizing levies or on training commanders, okay? And this is just your personal preference. What would you rather him do? Raise more troops or make better commanders? Uh, the third one is increase control in a county. Again, same idea. We haven't taken over any counties, but we may take one over and they may not be happy about it. He could increase the control. Finally, Mayor Fensnecta, we have him as our intrigue guy, and he could do one of three things. He can either disrupt schemes that are being run against you, okay? Or he can help schemes that you are running. The more people that you get involved in your schemes, the better the chance of success, all right? Um, so hostile scheme power, he gives you a plus 21. And we'll get into this when we do intrigue, but hostile scheme success chance, plus 10, okay? So he could support our schemes or he can disrupt other schemes. And then finally, he could go find secrets. Now secrets, again, when we talk about intrigue, secrets are very important. If you find out secrets about other characters, you can use that to get them to do what you want. All right, but we'll cover that more next time in Intrigue. For this time, I think we've covered the council. I think I've given you the basic building blocks of how the council works. Of course, all other things being equal, the better the skill, the better for you. These are your representatives. They will be out doing these tasks, whether it be diplomacy or stewardship or intrigue or martial, they will be doing tasks for you. The better the skills that they have, the better events will fire for you in the game. Um, and if they're bad at their job, the more negative events that will pop up. Uh, and so keep that in mind. As our religion, as it is, our bishop will always be our learning, chan or, uh, learning counselor. Luckily, we have a very good one here, uh, and our primary spouse will always be on the council. She may be helping us generally, or she can also help us specifically if she's very good at one single thing. Um, and every one of these counselors will be doing a job, and it's one of three things. Right now, each one pretty much, except for the spy master, has one blacked out because they really relate to counties that you've taken over. 
And with that, I want to thank you for joining me this time. Uh, I hope that that really helped you learn about council, how the council works here. Next time, I think we're going to dive into intrigue, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we still have to talk about interacting with other characters. We'll do a whole episode on that. We'll do a whole episode on the military. Uh, but, you know, we've moved quite, quite a ways through this game. It's looking like it's going to be about 12 episodes. And then I'll do one kind of tying it all together. And we'll use that to start our Let's Play. And we'll do a Let's Play with the Petty King here that I've decided I'm going to call the King of Ireland because that is going to be our big goal is to be the King of Ireland. And who knows, maybe Britannia. So, for Strategy Gaming Dojo, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, uh, please give me a subscribe or a like or leave a comment. Tell me how I'm doing. I would appreciate it. Uh, and as always, thank you for joining me. I'll talk to you next time.